evening again. Praise the Lord. Thank you for coming in this evening. So happy to see all of you. And I know that your heart must be very excited to have this date night with Jesus. This is the, you know, like when we were at we were having a date with our beloved. And so Jesus is our beloved. Praise the Lord. Now this evening, we want to look at this portion from Psalm 3, which is the lifter of my head, my glory and the lifter of my head, which is, of course, talking about the Lord. Now, there is a background to the story because when you read Psalm 3, right, there is a description that was written originally by the psalmist. And you say it's a psalm of David when he fled from his son, Absalom. All right, Absalom has been, uh, you know, openly rebelling against the king. And so this was written when he was really grieved. So let's talk about Absalom. He was the uh, third son of David, and uh, David got 19 sons, and of course he had also daughters. And then I think two more sons he had, they passed away when they were infants. But uh, here Absalom, his name was very nice. He was called the father of peace. But yet in his heart, he had a lot of ambition. And he was even willing to kill his father in order to gain the throne. But Absalom started off as one of David's favorite sons. And because he was a very charming young man, and he was able to communicate, and he was very good looking, very handsome guy. In fact, the Bible says that in all Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. All right. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish in him. So he was physically endowed. And so that, you know, put some kind of pride in him. But he was also a very vengeful person. Because if you know the background of the story was that there was his half-brother called Amnon. What happened was that Amnon lasted after his sister, the sister of the same mother, though King David was the father, of course. And so Amnon ended up raping the sister. And Absalom learned about it, and he was very furious because King David didn't take any action. Uh, King David was kind of a cover it up, you know, and say, this is a family matter. And so for two years, Absalom was very quiet, didn't do anything, apparently, you know, very passive. But inside, he was planning for the destruction of Amnon. And so he planned for a party. He convinced the king, he said that, ask Amnon to come, ask all the king's sons to come, you know, and let's have a party. And then later on in that party, he killed Amnon. So Absalom ordered his men, listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I'll say to you, strike Amnon down, then kill him, right? Don't be afraid. Haven't I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So that he was telling his men, those assassins, to be strong because he said, I'm going to give you the courage, the bonus. So he was a very vengeful man, but very scheming because he was planning this thing for two years. Now, so he fled. After he killed his brother, he fled and he went to Gersher. Now, what is, where is Gersher? The king of Gersher actually was the uh, grandfather, all right? That the daughter of the king of Gersher married King David. And so that's why rightfully Absalom ran to his grandfather. He stayed there for three years. And the Bible says that and King David longed to go to Absalom in spite of that sin, in spite of that crime, in spite of that murder, that love between David, you know, or at least David loved the son so much, loved Absalom so much, that he longed to go to him. And that tells us something about our spiritual father, that in spite of how we treat him and how we betray him and how we dislike him, our heavenly father long to come to us. So every time when you read the story, read especially in this Psalm 3, it's talking about Jesus Christ, it's talking about God. All these are symbols for us to grasp and for us to understand. And so uh, he was 
consoled concerning Amnon's death means that he already kind of, uh, his spirit though was grief, but now he was okay. And so he wanted the son to come back. And so the son came back, and but the son had ulterior motive. So he began to pursue fame. He began to pursue the popularity. So in the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses with 50 men to run ahead of him. So that kind of a splendor, you know, that kind of a glory that he put before him, as though that he was already the heir to the throne, as though he was already the king. He would get up early in the morning and he would stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. You know why the city gate? Because at the gate, that's where all the transactions where all the court cases, where anybody who need the uh, audience of the king would meet at the gate. They do not, they did not meet at the palace. They only met at the gate. That's why later on you find that David had to go to the gate to, uh, you know, to show himself to the people. And so he would get up there and he would talk to the people and he would be very nice. And he would say that, you know, if you only allow me to handle your case, and your case will be solved. And so people began to like him. And so he quietly, he usurped the authority of the king. You know, kind of saying that, look, you know, your king, this king is not so good, but I, your, your future king, I am much better. And so he became very popular. You know what he did? He said, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, you know, Absalom would reach out his hand and take hold of the man and kiss him. Now, it's in their, their custom, of course, they kiss on the left and the right and right and the left, you know. Uh, you have seen that. You have seen in the Middle East, they kiss each other like that. So, so kiss him. And so imagine, you know, if you have been kissed by the prince, and this is supposed to, he presented himself as the crown prince, even though David never said that this would be the crown prince, but you know, with 50 horses, I mean, with 50 men running in front of him and horses and chariots and all that, that must be a crown prince, you see? So he kind of put that image there for people to see. So he began to gain a lot of followers. People began to say, this will make a good king. And some of them even thought that we should get rid of this old king, you know, this old fool. And then we put up this guy, this, this young chap is really good, you know? And so he was artfully deceptive. Absalom behaved in this way towards all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And what he did was that he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. You see, you can steal many things, but you're going to steal the heart of the people. So what he did was that he was trying to form allies. He was trying to form, you know, like a fan club, <laughs> okay, where people began to say, this guy is really great. Then one day, he usurped the throne, okay? He went to Hebron, and then there, he openly declared himself as king. And then he had gathered armies, had gathered many people, because he's secret, he sent secret messengers throughout the tribe of Israel. As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. Hebron. So what happened is that in every city, he got agents, he got spies, he got people, his own men, and they were all carrying the banners and ready to raise up. And just as the right time they had, the coordinated time, then trumpet began to blow in every city, every town, every village. And people will rise up and say, Absalom is king in Hebron. And suddenly this kind of a news spread across the land, open rebellion. So here David became alarmed and he began to run. He got his whole household and they departed from uh, Jerusalem. And he began to go to the, uh, the Garden of Olive, okay? Uh, so, so, so went through that place there and began to run away from Absalom. And while he was running, that during the quiet of the night, he began to write the psalm. He said, Lord, how many are my foes? 
how many rise up against me? Suddenly, you know, what happened was that the people he ruled, the people he loved, the people he treasured turned against him. And now they cited the, now they cite the son and they're going to get rid of him. And so he said, all these are my enemies and they have reason against me. So he did what was right. He complained to God first. He came to God. Now, most of us, when we got enemies against us or people want to destroy us and, and you know, uh, take our uh, the position that God gave to us and take it illegally, then what we did is that we counter scheme and we try to fight back and we try to, you know, plot uh, all kinds of plan to destroy the enemy. No, David then, he ran away. So it seems like he was a coward but he ran to seek God because the best place is that to prevent conflict because in the conflict, his man may kill his son. So he loved his son so much. Yeah. So he ran and then he also didn't want his son to kill him. Right. So he said, how many are my foes and how many rise up against me? When it came to the time of Jesus, what did he say? Jesus had many people who rose against him. So David was a symbol, you know, a, a kind, a type of Christ. And so what he went through, Jesus later on went through. He did every good things. You know, when he entered into the, into the city, the people shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, you know, they declare him as king and they welcome him. And then just within a few days, they say, crucify him. Can you see? And so when, you know, Pilate asked, you know, you choose between this criminal and Jesus, you know, they said, give us the criminal. Uh, we will kill Jesus. Yeah. And so then the people said, his blood will be on us and on our children. That's the kind of hatred they had for Jesus. And so when you see this comparison here, you will understand what David was going through and what Jesus was going through, okay? And then we must be very careful that we do not take on the spirit of Absalom whereby we come against God right now. Some of us are very upset because maybe we are sick or maybe we don't have uh, certain things that we want or there is a certain relationship that we haven't been able to uh, 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 get and so we are upset with God and then we become like Absalom and we'll rise against God. Now it will be futile of course, it will be hopeless to rise against God but yet the human nature can be so carnal, can be so filled with the spirit of Absalom and also the spirit of Lucifer that we will rise against God. And many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. Because throughout now, the whole nation are saying that God has discarded David. David is no longer the rightful king. And in the same manner, you find that when it came to Jesus, right? What happened was that when they, when they put him on the cross, what did they say? He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's a king of Israel, right? Like David, right? He's a king of Israel. Let him come down. Now from the cross. And we will believe in him. Right? He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants. If he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. So they took everything that he taught them. Everything that he revealed to them. That during those good times when he was feeding the 5,000. He was preaching a sermon. He was teaching them on the, on the mountain and by the sea and so on. Everywhere. All right, all those good words, they took those good words and they turned those words against him. And so in their mind, they say God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me. Wow, this is great. My glory, the one who lifts my head high. So my glory and the lifter of my head. In another, the translation says so. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. Now here for David, indeed God became a shield around him. 
Now, it's not just the shield in front of him, but you are talking about shield all around him. Means that he was then totally protected. No matter what Absalom did, could not touch him. Because God's hands around him. I want you to know that today, of course, today, the shield of God is around you. You know why? Because you have the Holy Spirit. You not just have the Holy Spirit, right? But of course, his angels around you. But most important thing is that you have the Holy Spirit, right? You have the Holy Spirit inside you. So my glory, the one who lift my head. So when you have, when you are going through trouble like that, that time David's head was down. David's head was like, you know, in grief. How could my son, how can this son of mine, whom I love so much, come against me? You see, nothing is worse than the person you love and that person who you love betrayed. That's why we can understand, you know, when a uh, family goes through a crisis, when a husband betrays the wife and the wife betrays the husband or the children betray the parents. And that kind of grief, David understood, Jesus understood, right? So he couldn't raise his hand, but he said, my glory, the one, my God, he is the lifter of my head. Because you see, God will not always want you to bow your head in grief. He will restore you and he will lift up your head and he will make sure that you look up to heaven and you receive the blessing of heaven. Hallelujah. And tonight you can do it. Tonight, you know, in the meditation, you can look up to heaven as you listen to the word. You know, what is going to happen is that those words will have wings and then it would lift you up to heaven. And you will enjoy the presence of God. He is the lifter of your head. No matter what you are going through, you can be in financial bondage. You may be suffering from cancer. You may be sick. You may have all kinds of infirmities. But tonight, you have the glory of God here. Tonight, he is the lifter of your head. That's why David said, I call out to the Lord. I cry to the Lord. I cry unto the Lord. And he answers me, from his holy mountain. What do you mean by his holy mountain? That glorious presence of God. That on Mount Sinai where he revealed himself to Moses. And that suddenly God is the God of the mountain. That every time when you want to look to God, you raise your head and you look. If you do not look up to heaven, you can look to the mountain. He is the God of every mountain. Means that all the peaks he has dominated. And so that's what David said. I don't care what. I may be in the valley, but my eyes can behold the mountain. And which means that when your destination is the mountain, you move towards the mountain. Hallelujah. You're going to have a mountaintop experience. Okay? Don't be despair. I don't want you to let the word of God, you know, put you in despair. But the word of God give you, give you victory. All right? So when you start to listen to this uh, uh, word here, you find that you, can also stand on the mountaintop. So David ultimately got set free. He came back to become the king again. And his son, who was very proud of his hair, you know, his hair, every year when he cut his hair, is about 2.4 kg heavy. Uh, 2.4 kg, that heavy, that much of hair. All right. A very gorgeous man, you know, handsome, tall. Thick hair. <laughs> but that was his downfall. That because he was riding on a mule and then suddenly his hair got caught. Somehow God allowed the branches of a tree to trap his hair. And then he was, he, 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 he was hung there, you know. And Joab, the commander, came and killed him. With three spears, killed him. And the rest of the soldiers came and chopped him to pieces and buried him in the pit. And when they went back, David told them, actually, his instruction was, nah, do not touch my son. Do not kill him. But the soldiers did not uh, listen to the king because he, uh, Joab especially, you see, Joab was a nephew of David. And Joab was a general. And he was a commander of the army. And so he said, kill him. Right? Kill him. And when he came back and 
the news came and David broke. David grief. David cried, my son, my son, Absalom, Absalom, my son. Until Joab came back and said, excuse me, sir. You are not going out there to meet the soldiers who brought back your kingdom. And you are here grieving after somebody who wanted to kill you. Have you got this thing wrong? And now all the soldiers are coming back to the city and they are creeping in, you know, as though that they had been defeated. They just won a big victory. They defeated the army of your, that rebellious son. Sir, please go to the gate and sit there and let everybody see that you are welcoming them back. But if not, by the evening time, there won't be a single soldier left who will be loyal to you. Wow. That kind of word woke up David and say, yes, I got it wrong. Okay. I got to thank my men who, you know, risked their life to bring back the kingdom for me. And so he was restored. So he say, you see what happened? He said, the lifter of his head. But there wasn't any answer for Jesus. When Jesus was on the cross, there were no shield around him. Nothing. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isn't that surprising? God saved David and God didn't save Jesus, the son of God. You know why he did that? He did that because of you and me. You see? Because that day, Jesus would take all our sin, whether it's past sin, present sin, future sin, he would take them upon himself. And he would be the most sinful creature or the person, not he was, of course, the creator, but he took on the image of a man. So he would be the most sinful man in the universe, in the whole wide world world in the history of mankind because he took on all the sins of mankind. That's why God could not look at him. God covered his face. God did not respond. God did not send the angels. God did not take him off the cross. No answer for Jesus. And he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. Tonight, receive your healing. No shield for him, but God is shielding you because his righteousness is now yours. His health is now yours. That he is going to heal you by the stripe that he had gone through is going to bring healing to you. So, David now says this, I lie down and sleep. I wake up again, because the Lord sustained me. So what he's saying is that, you see, I was defeated, I ran away, all right, and I was so tired, and I rested, and I got up, I survived the night. No enemy attacked me, I survived, all right? My son did not attack me, because if they were to come, I would be utterly destroyed, but because the Lord sustained me. Then he said, I will not fear to tens of thousands assail me on every side. Suddenly, after the night of rest, he, his spirit was refreshed. You know, his soul was recharged. And he said, I will not fear because my trust is in the Lord. You see, what happened was that for Jesus, for Jesus, he also rested. He also died. He actually went to hell for us. But because he was righteous, Hell could not hold him. He rose again. So what happened was that the Bible tells, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. So you see that Jesus, when he died, he died defeated. He died in sin. But then he rose again in victory. Because why? 
because of the grace and the mercy of God, and that because of his righteousness, because he is the king of kings and lords of lords, and no grave can hold him, he rose again. So he did rest, and then he did rise again. And so David said, Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. Wow. He is asking the Lord to fight his battle. This is a good prayer. Every time when you are going through a crisis, tell God, deliver me, my Lord, my God. All right, strike my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. Now, what happened is this is this. Jesus, you know what? For the Son of Man will come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will repay each one according to what he has done. You know what Jesus is going to do? He's going to come back again. And he is going to destroy the work of the enemy. He is not just going to punch the guy on the jaw. He's going to crush the head of the serpent. He's going to crush his head. All right. And then he's going to punch his teeth out. You know what I mean by punching the teeth out? That is to say all the deception, all the lies, all the condemnation that come out from the mouth of the enemy. All right. And this Words that come from mouth or enemy is being put into human enemies. And so people around you who attack you and who, you know, have all kinds of bad things to say about you, say you are stupid, say you are an idiot, and so on and so forth. All these people will have their teeth all smashed, <laughs> right? So that is when Jesus come back again. And even right now, I can tell you that the Lord say to you, he said two things, two things that belongs to him. One is the glory. Glory of God, you cannot, you cannot touch. You cannot partake. If it is of God, you do not touch. All right? The glory of the king, you do not touch. Absalom touched the glory of the king. All right? That's why God destroyed him. Okay? If Absalom would be humble, God will raise him up. But he was prideful. He was proud. Okay? Glory, you do not touch. Vengeance, you do not touch. Because the Lord said, vengeance is mine. Okay? And so this is what, you do. So when David surrendered the vengeance to the Lord, the Lord took over. The Lord took over. And that's why, how on earth, you know, could this man ride a donkey and got stuck on the tree and entangled by the head? You have never thought of this kind of a, a trap, right? Till all these years, you know, you never see military use this type of trap. Never. But God did it. God said, you want to mess with me? You think that you are very glorious? You think that your hair is so beautiful? I'm going to use that to trap you. You think that you are very brilliant? Your mind is very, very, very smart and you are so proud of it? I'm going to use that to trap you. Can you see? Because you are not, you know, that there are what we call the protocol. If you do not abide with the protocol, there are positions that you cannot take. So the king got to be the king. You, If you're the subject, you be the subject, until the Lord promote you to be the king. So when David was a subject, he was a very humble subject. He did not seek to kill King Saul. He didn't, right? Two times he was able to kill King Saul, but he didn't. Because why? He will not touch the Lord's anointed. Wow, I tell you. But Absalom touched the Lord's anointed. And that's why God will repay. And Jesus is saying, if anyone touched the church, the church is the Lord's anointed, not just a pastor. The church, the whole church. You know what happened? He said he come back. He's going to deal with them harshly. And so David concludes by saying, from the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. So when he came back as king, he understood this one thing. He was saved by God, delivered by God, returned to power by God. And because he returned to power, he was a responsible king and then may the blessing be upon God's people. And that's what you should be. When you become a servant leader, don't think of your position, but think of how the blessing will be upon God's people. And so this Jesus, the Bible says, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation exists in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. Even King David got to be saved by the name of Jesus. 
got to be saved by Jesus. So King David looked forward to the salvation provided by Jesus. We look back to the salvation provided by Jesus on the cross. Can you see? That's why this psalm is so meaningful. I'd like you to go back and read again until it becomes your psalm. Psalm 3 is a very beautiful one talking about Jesus. And so the lifter of my head. 